Hello everybody, this is Displace, and in today's video, we will be doing a deep dive into the DPS Rogue. Phase 3 of Season of Discovery has brought some interesting new abilities to the class, making it even easier to maximize our DPS. For this guide, I'm going to be going over the following. Builds, Rotation, Stat Priority, Consumables, Macros, and Add-ons. There are two DPS builds both in the assassin tree and they revolve around how complex you want your rotation to be assassin is currently the leader in dps and subtlety and combat unfortunately don't have anything comparable that will give us the same amount of damage unlike the last phase depending upon the build you want to go with will depend upon the runes you should take and your rotation so let's get into the build first the first and easiest build is going to be the standard poison build this is pretty much the same build as we had last phase, with some minor adjustments to some talent points due to some of the new runes. The strength of this build is in your poisons, and due to the synergy of the runes in phase 1 and phase 2, this build continues to be at the top of the list. First off, we're going to be putting 5 points into Opportunity from the Subtlety Tree. Since Mutilate benefits from backstab abilities, this is going to give your Mutilate an extra 20% damage when you are behind your target, which should be always. Moving over to the combat tree, we'll be putting 5 points into Lightning Reflexes. This increases our dodge chance, which isn't something we really need, but it's a great mitigation talent, and it's better than the other two options. It also opens up the tree for the next talent, which we do need, and that's going to be Improved Backstab. So we're going to put 3 points into this. This is going to increase the critical strike chance done by our Mutilate ability, since again, it benefits from any Backstab ability. Moving over to the assassination tree, we're going to be putting 5 points into Malice, increasing our crit chance, but also allowing us to get Lethality further down in the tree. Moving down, we're going to be putting 3 points into Ruthlessness. This is going to give us more chances to use in Venom. And we'll be taking both points in Murder. This gives us a 2% increased damage to Humanoids, Giants, Beasts, and Dragonkin. This talent right here is going to make a huge difference in Sunken Temple. On to the next row, we take one point in Relentless Strikes. This one's pretty self-explanatory. And then four points into Lethality. This is going to increase the critical strike damage of our Backstab, which means our Mutilate gets more crit damage. We are basically moving the three points we had in Improved Slice and Dice over to here. This is because we'll be using a Rune, which helps keep Slice and Dice active. More on that a little later. Next, we're going to be taking 5 points into Vile Poisons. This increases the damage of our poisons by 20%, which is pretty powerful. And then 5 points into Improved Poisons, which means we have a 10% increased chance to apply our poisons. What this means is that Instant Poison now has a 30% chance to be applied instead of the baseline 20. 1 point into Cold Blood, which gives our Mutilate ability a 100% crit chance. Now if we combine this with Master of Subtlety, we have a good little increase to DPS. And last but not least, 2 points into Seal Fate. This is going to give us a 40% chance to add an additional combo point when we crit with any ability that adds a combo point. What's really powerful about Seal Fate is that it triggers when we crit with any ability that adds a combo point. So usually this means mutilate. However, Envenom can crit, and because of ruthlessness, any finishing move has a 60% chance to add a combo point to your target, which means Seal of Fate not only procs off of mutilate, but off of Envenom as well, which is really powerful. This is a straightforward build that puts emphasis on poison damage, and is really, really powerful. The next DPS build we have is the Carnage build. This build uses pretty much all of the same talents, but we'll be adding Rupture to our rotation and using the Carnage Rune. With this setup, we're going to have a more complicated rotation, and we're going to need to maintain both Slice and Dice and Rupture as close to 100% as possible. More on that after we actually discuss the talents. So for the talents, this is the same exact setup as the previous build, but we put 3 points into Improved Slice and Dice, and only 1 point into Lethality. I'll go over this more when we discuss the rotation, but the reason we want improved slice and dice is because we need to balance that along with the rupture dot and in Vena, so we need the longer uptime for slice and dice. The runes that we used last phase for our build are going to be the same ones that we use this phase, and they are as followed. For our hands, we're going to use mutilate. Mutilate is still really strong, and it's our go-to rune for our hands and our main ability. 
For our chest, we're going with Deadly Brew. This is probably the most important rune you're going to equip and has led to a lot of confusion on how it works. So there's four things with this rune. First, when you inflict any other poison on the target, you also inflict Deadly Poison. This means that, for example, if you have Mind Numbing Poison on your dagger, when that deals poison damage, you'll also deal Deadly Poison. Number two, and probably the most important, is that if your weapon does not have a poison applied, it has a chance to trigger instant poison as if instant poison were applied. And this is where the confusion comes from. What this means is that you don't need to have any poisons on your weapon for PvE. The confusion was around the proc chance. People were under the impression that the instant poison proc chance was lower for the rune than if they actually had the poison applied. But the last sentence clearly says, it has a chance to trigger as if instant poison was applied. So based upon our talents, our poisons have a 30% chance to be applied. And we have the same 30% chance even when we don't have the poisons on our daggers. It also means that once instant poison is applied, deadly poison will also be applied. So you're basically getting two poison hits every time poison is applied. The third thing is that deadly and instant poison damage is increased from your attack power. This is really powerful because it means your poisons scale with your gear and level. So instead of being a flat amount of damage, there's a modifier based upon your attack power. And the last thing is that the instant and deadly poison that this rune applies is based upon your highest learned poison. So if you haven't upskilled your poisons, it's only going to apply rank one or whatever your lowest rank is. So leveling poisons is a must. Once leveled, this rune will be using Instant Poison 4 and Deadly Poison 3, which is a huge DPS increase, especially because as stated before, the poison damage scales with your attack power. For our pants, we'll be using Envenom. This deals instant poison damage based upon the number of deadly poison doses on the target. And it has a 75% increased frequency of applying instant poison, which then, because of Deadly Brew, turns around and deals deadly poison. The next rune will be Shadow Step, which is going to be on our waist. And this is going to be able to put you behind your target, as well as increase your movement speed for three seconds. There are a few benefits of this rune. First off is that it helps close the gap between you and the enemy. For example, if you had to run out and then you need to get back in quickly. You can also use it to move out of the way of certain mechanics. For our feet, we'll be taking Master of Subtlety. This increases the damage by 10% for six seconds after coming out of stealth. So this is going to make our openings stronger. It also allows us to use Vanish in the middle of the fight for a small DPS increase considering Vanish puts us back into stealth. So the first new rune we'll be using is going to be on our wrists, and it depends upon which build we are going to go with. If we are going to go with the simple poison build, we are going to use Cut to the Chase. This causes our Envenom and our Eviscerate abilities to refresh the duration of our Slice and Dice to the 5 point max. What's really powerful about this is that we don't need to get to 5 points to start with. So you can apply Slice and Dice at 2 points and then mutilate until you get to 4 or 5 points. And then when you hit Envenom, Slice and Dice refreshes at its 5 point max. This is awesome because it saves you energy and combo points to use on other hard-hitting abilities. If you're going with the Carnage build, you will want, well, Carnage. This is going to increase your damage by 20% on targets that have a bleed effect from you. And our current bleed effect is Rupture. The last rune is the Head Slot, and it can be any one of three different runes. The weakest of the three is Focused Attacks. This is probably the easiest of the three head runes to get, and it's a good starter rune if you don't have the other ones. And because we have a lot of talents that increase our crit chance, this does proc fairly often. But two energy off of a crit isn't very much. The next two runes are actually the more powerful ones which you want to go for. They are Honor Among Thieves and Combat Potency. Which rune you take will depend upon various factors as well as group makeup. So Honor Among Thieves allows you to gain a combo point if anyone in your party has a critical hit. So the power of this rune comes from your group makeup. If they don't crit a lot, or if they don't have a lot of abilities to spam to allow them to crit, or if they're dead, this may be a DPS loss for you. So if you choose this rune, 
you're putting the additional combo point onto your group makeup, onto your teammates. And because of that, it doesn't matter if your offhand is fast or slow. The other rune is combat potency. This brings the responsibility back onto you. And this gives you a 20% chance to gain 15 energy when dealing damage with your offhand weapon. So for this rune to be effective, you need to have a very fast offhand dagger. 1.3 or 1.4 speed. This is something I need to emphasize. The choice between Honor Among Thieves and Combat Potency is going to be up to you. There's no right or wrong rune for the head slot. If you are soloing, obviously you're going to be doing Combat Potency. If you have a group makeup that just has bad crit chances, you're going to want to use Combat Potency. If you are in a really great stellar group, Honor Among Thieves may be your best option. So don't be afraid to play around with these two runes to see which is better in a given circumstance. The rotation will be very similar for both builds, with the Carnage build adding just a little bit more complexity. So regardless of which build we go with, we should always be doing our best to enter combat stealth to gain the benefit of Master of Subtlety. Remember, we can use Shadow Step while stealth, which will put us directly behind the enemy. So for the simple Poison build, the rotation is going to be as follows. If you're stealth, we're going to use Garrett as an opener. We're going to cast Mutilate to get two or three combo points, and then cast Slice and Dice. We're going to cast Mutilate until we get up to five combo points, and then cast in Venom. This is going to refresh your Slice and Dice back up to the five point maximum. From here, it's just Mutilate and in Venom at five points. That's it. For the Carnage build, the rotation is going to be a little bit more complex. So if stealth, we're still going to use Garrett as the opener. We're going to cast Mutilate to build up our combo points, and then cast Slice and Dice once we reach five points. We're going to go back to Mutilate to build up our combo points again, and cast Rupture at five points. We're going to then use Mutilate to continue to build up our combo points, and then cast in Venom as a filler. But we have to prioritize Slice and Dice and Rupture uptime. This means that if either Slice and Dice or Rupture is going to fall off, we prioritize that over in Venom. During the fight, we can use Vanish to refresh our Master of Subtlety, and then use Kick if we need to interrupt anything. Cold Blood should be used on cooldown. And if we're looking for a more multi-target scenario, we can switch out the Shadow Step rune for the Shuriken Toss rune. This costs 30 energy and hits up to 4 targets, so it's easy to spam this ability and get some AoE damage in. The priority for our stats has not changed since Phase 2, and they're going to be the following. Agility. Attack power, crit chance, strength, hit rating, and stamina. As we see, our main stats we are looking for is agility and attack power. One point of agility gives us one point of attack power, as well as some crit. As it currently stands, we need 29 points of agility to give us a 1% increase to crit. This is really important to remember because there's some gear in phase three that has attack power and a 1% crit chance in lieu of agility, which we want to consider as it's sometimes more powerful than the gear with just agility on it. Attack power increases the amount of damage we deal with our attacks and abilities. And because we're using the deadly brew and in venom runes, it'll also increase the damage of our instant and deadly poisons. Critical Strike is next, as its power lies in the fact that we'll be attacking consistently and quickly due to Slice and Dice, which means we have more chances to crit. For Strength, one point of Strength grants one point of attack power. But unlike Agility, it does not grant crit, which makes it weaker. But this does mean that Strength and Attack Power can be used interchangeably if necessary. It also means gear with both Agility and Strength on it are really good for us. Hit rating increases our chance to actually hit the target, and although this stat is important, there is quite a bit of gear now that has hit rating on it, so we don't need to focus too much on this stat. And the last stat is stamina. Each point of stamina gives us 10% health. So this could be considered a DPS increase because it keeps us alive, which is the only way we can DPS. Phase 3 brings in quite a few new consumables. To start with, we're going to be looking at our weapons. Since we don't need to apply poisons to our weapons because we're using Deadly Brew, we're going to be using one of the following. Either Dense Sharpening Stones or Shadow Oil. If you have a Druid or Shaman in your group, you only need to use a Sharpening Stone or Shadow Oil on your offhand as your main hand weapon will be utilizing Wild Strikes 
or Wind Fury Totem. There are quite a few main consumables that we should be using. We have Elixir of the Mongoose, which gives us an additional 25 agility and critical hit by 2%. Elixir of Giants gives us 25 to strength. Winterfall Firewater increases our attack power by 35. And from phase one, Elixir of Coalesced Regret actually gives plus one to all stats. Now, this may be too expensive for that plus one, but it is something to give us just a slight increase in DPS. For our food buff, the best food this phase is going to be Grilled Squid. This is going to give us an additional 10 agility for 10 minutes. However, the squid is seasonal and they are only able to be fished in the winter time. So depending upon how much your server actually fished in previous phases will depend upon the price, and it could be very expensive. So it's probably better to stick with the Dragon Breath Chili from the last phase. This food causes you to breathe fire, which gives you a DPS increase. And then there's Thistle Tea, which restores all of our energy. Other consumables we should be interested in is Oil of Immolation, which is really good for AoE situations. Limited Invulnerability Potion. This makes you immune to physical attacks for 6 seconds and can be used if you find yourself in a life and death situation. And then there's always the Free Action Potion, which makes you immune to stun and movement impairing effects. With the combination of the Limited Invulnerability Potion and the Free Action Potion, there's quite a bit of boss mechanics that we can actually avoid. There's only a handful of macros that we can use to improve our DPS and utility in fights. The first one can be used with Distract, or if you're an engineer, any of your bombs. This macro changes the ability to be used where your cursor is instead of having to work with the green circle. So here's the macros. As you can see, for the bomb, you have to use the Stop Casting command because it is a casting ability, and any other abilities that you try and use will break the casting. So without the macro, we have to manually pick where this goes, and then press the mouse button. Using the macro, it automatically uses the ability wherever our mouse is. The next macro can be used for both blind and kick, and it makes this a mouse over ability. So as long as the target you're mousing over is an enemy, and it's not dead, you can use this ability. This makes it easy, as you don't have to actually click off of your target, which will cause you to lose your combo points. The awesome thing about this macro is that if you aren't mousing over anything else, it will still work on your current target. So, for example, you know, here I'm DPSing this target. If I was in range of the other one, I could kick it. Since I'm out of range of this target dummy, I can't use it. But once I'm no longer mousing over it, I can kick my current target. Add-ons for rogues hasn't changed at all from phase two. So there's still a handful that I use. The first one being Tula range. So if an ability is out of range, it's going to highlight the entire ability red. So as you can see, if I, all my abilities are fine, but if I click this combat dummy, all of the abilities that I'm out of range on are highlighted in red. And as I move closer, they, they unhighlight, which means now I can use them. This is really good because the default UI just highlights the number of the ability in red, and this kind of brings it to your forefront. Now, um, this does not work if you're using an add-on like Bartender. Uh, it only works for the default UI. And if you look, here are some of the settings that you can use. So as we can see from the options here, we have three ways we can color our abilities. Anything that's out of range, anything that's out of mana, or for the rogue out of energy, it's really anything out of resource, and then anything that's unusable. Okay, so if we look, we can change the color or the opacity, right? So any of the abilities that are unusable are actually gray. So like my slice and dice, you can see under here my Envenom. And as we can see, changing the opacity will make all of these abilities disappear off of my action. I, like, I really like the gray, but as you can see out of mana, not really useful for it to be blue. Let's actually change this to something stupid like purple. And I'll show you what this looks like. All right. So as you can see, everything's red. Right? As we approach, the red goes away. And then as we 
uh, continue to use our abilities, we lose energy. And as you can see, all of those abilities turn purple because we don't have the energy to use them. But as you can see, my slice and dice is available, but my envenom is not because I don't have any poisons on the target, so I can't use it. This is a really powerful add-on that allows you just at a quick glance to see what's available and what's not, what you can use and what you can't. The next add-on is Ice HUD. It's a heads-up display that centers your health and energy around your player, keeping your focus front and center. It includes things like combo points and an energy ticker. The power of this is that you are already looking at your character and it's easy just to see out of the peripheral uh, where everything is at so you don't actually have to go and look at your frames or take your eyes off of where you are. So as you can see, we have the enemy of the health, we have my health, we have a little combo point here. So as we continue, right, and then you can see the little energy ticker saying, hey, this is when we're going to actually get more energy. And this is highly customizable. So you can change quite a bit about this. And I think this is a really powerful add-on where it just keeps your gaze front and center. The last add-on is actually a weak aura. Uh, this is a weak aura from Sabamaru. I'll actually link it in the description below. But it comes with um, pretty much everything you need for just basic rogue stuff. It keeps track of things like your uh, abilities, like puncture and slice and dice. And um, it has an energy bar. It has your combo points. And it actually has a swing timer, which is right here. You know, so as we're going, you know, we can actually use this. It has an energy ticker as well. And as we go through, you know, if we need to, for example, kidney punch, you know, it'll tell you how long that's on cooldown. Can't be used. So this is really powerful as well if you don't like any of the other heads up display ones that we mentioned. The next add-on is not really a rogue-specific one, but I have been asked about it in the past. If you like bigger unit frames and want to keep the classic look, the add-on that you want is called Easy Frames. One benefit of this is that there is some additional customization that you can do, but it also provides the enemy health in actual numbers and not just a percentage. If you've enjoyed this guide, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so I can continue helping people. And as always, I love hearing from everybody, so drop a comment below and let me know what you thought about this video.